Thank you all for being here and for valuing the past, present, and future of American writing. We're here today to talk about fictionalizing the past, about writing real and imagined people in real and imagined history. In Logan Steiner's After Anne, that means following Lucy Montgomery, Maud Montgomery as she chooses between a life as a single writer or the wife of a man mad with religious fervor. In Elizabeth Blackwell's Red Mistress, that means following an aristocratic Russian woman through revolution, early Soviet conspiracies, and forbidden love. Logan is a lawyer and writer, and After Anne is her first novel. Elizabeth's other work include, includes the books While Beauty Slept and On a Cold Dark Sea. Please join me in welcoming them both. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I told Logan I'm very old school. I have index cards I will be consulting um, here and there. Um, this event is titled The Truth About Historical Fiction, and I thought that was just way too much pressure. Um, I, I don't think the two of us are qualified to tell you the entire truth about historical fiction. Um, so I decided to subtitle it The Truth About Writing Historical Fiction, um, Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. So um, starting off with why historical fiction? Why is that the genre that we have both uh, chosen to write in? And there are various approaches that writers take. Um, some writers want to write about a specific historical event and use the novel process as a way to explore that event. So my most recent book, Red Mistress, liter literally came from me thinking to myself, how did the Russian Revolution happen? Um, I had never, I was a history major in college, but I had never actually studied Russian history in depth. Um, and it, when I realized how much um, the world changed in, in, in Russia within just a couple of years, like completely, I just kind of went down this research rabbit hole to kind of find out more. And through researching, I came up with a storyline. Um, other historical fiction writers want find a person in history that they are fascinated with. They want to find out more. The more they learn about that person, the more it makes them want to write a story expo exploring um, maybe what we don't know about that person. Um, so I wanted to start by asking Logan, why Lucy Maud Montgomery? Why was she the person that you felt like you had to write about? Yes, it's such a such a big question, and I. Um, you know, for me, it really was person focused and um, I have to start with with Anne of Green Gables because Anne of Green Gables was such a cherished part of my growing up and I really credit Anne and her character for my dreams of writing books someday and not not just the dream of writing a book, but believing, you know, that me as a little girl that I could I could um, persist and do it and I think that. Uh, you know, when we think about Anne and why she's stayed with so much, so many of us for so long, um, and I loved learning the history of this museum, which is so much about those writers and those characters that have that staying power. And really, there's there's such an interesting question in why. And I can only answer for, her, for myself, but for me, Anne has had such staying power um, because of just her unfiltered exuberant ways of being in the world and how she uh, wasn't afraid to put her feelings, her deepest feelings and thoughts out there. Um, and I think that that's, that's a key piece of who, who she is. Um, and I am somebody who, uh, like Anne and like Ellen Montgomery, wanted to write from a young age. And I've also always been deeply terrified of putting my work out there in the world as I'm doing right now. Um, and I think one of the um, things that has made me feel the least alone in that is learning about other creators and their lives. And so when I um, you know, went to write my first book, I was really interested in exploring the life of a creator whose work had meant a lot to me um, and um, really understanding kind of the hows and whys, that's the best way I've found to feel less alone. Um, and I learned, um, a little bit about the life of Ellen Montgomery, and I really felt like I wanted to know more immediately. I think, you know, just in unpacking it a little bit, I realized how much Ellen Montgomery is like Anne and, and sought to be like Anne and had that deep feeling nature. 
um, and all that she was up against in her time and place and history in being that person in the world and kind of all of the real struggles um, with, you know, um, being fully herself in the world. Um, and she really faced that bind. And that's a big uh, part of what the book explores. Um, and I think that that is about Maud's time and place, but I also think it's about our time and place right now. Um, you know, I found for me, it's a question that comes up uh, so often, you know, every time I sit down with a friend for dinner, um, every time I meet a new author friend, um, every time I go on social media and decide what to post, um, and then in, you know, preparing here today um, to, to speak to all of you, it's, you know, how genuine am I going to be and how much of myself and my deeply feeling self, a way in which I relate so much to Maud and so much to Anne, am I going to bring um, and am I going to be? And I think that's such a central question in terms of the way we are in the world and how we live. And it's something that I, I sought to explore in this book. So one of the great research, resources for you was the fact that um, Ellen Montgomery kept these diaries yes. and rewrote these diaries over time with the goal of them being published eventually, right? right? So she created a version of her life for public consumption, writing quite honestly. Um, yes. So in, in the one sense, the story of her life is has been out there for a long, long time in her own words. Um, however, what I loved about this book, you, you clearly took these diaries, you know, quotes from the diaries are in there, obviously, but also showed how much those diaries were in a way a work of fiction also. Um, she took truths about her life, but the way she chose to describe certain things was for a reason. She did not describe certain other pivotal moments of her life. Why didn't she write about those? So as you were reading her diaries, was that part of your inspiration too, was the parts that were left out was where your imagination could come in. Absolutely. And that's really where I felt like fiction had a place here. Um, and I, those diaries were such a tremendous resource. So they were published not only after her death, but she left the decision about when to publish them to her son. And he ended up deciding to publish them after he passed. Um, a really fascinating kind of undertaking. She started editing them in middle life. They're on the one hand, like Elizabeth said, so open. On the other hand, there are pieces that are missing. And they were such a resource for me as a fiction writer and trying to get as close to Maud's thinking and inside her head as much as possible. And so they were the place I started and the place that I ended in all of my research. Um, they also had gaps. So one of the biggest was the last few years of her life are largely absent from these journals. And Maud was somebody who really tried to not you know to to tell this story and there's a, there's a, this mystery this question left open by um her biography you know a very comprehensive biography that's been written of her life of what happened to this final journal it's you know there was a note by her bed when she passed indicating that there was a final journal was it you know, destroyed by her? Was it destroyed by somebody else? Was it taken? That was such an interesting mystery to me and a place where my imagination really uh, took off. And um, that question of, of what drove this beloved author to, to such a heartbreaking end, um, the fact that the, the last three years of her life were missing was just a driving force of the novel for me. Yeah. as well as so many other gaps, as you were saying. And her biographers talk about how she razored out pages. She, you know, left out certain people or certain people that we know are really important to her because of what others in her life have said, only get kind of scant mention in the book. And so those were also just fascinating to me. Yeah. Um, and an, another element of the book that I loved um, as a writer, because <laughs> you were a writer writing about a writer who was writing many levels. Um, at various points, um, Lucy is whatever going about her day and she hears Anne's voice, the voice of her character, which is a very distinctive voice. And I, th I think that's part of why Anne and Anne of Green Gables, um, that series, well, is still as popular um, as it is because yes. Anne is such a she very distinct character. character. So you have Lucy hearing Anne, you know, as if she is a real person speaking in a very distinct voice and, and giving 
was the courage to, you know, oh, Anne told, Anne would do this, Anne would do that. So as you were writing this book, and since you had really immersed yourself in the, in the diaries as well, were you hearing your character? hearing your character speak to you did that did yes. you have those moments <laughs> where you're like what's your, for better something's for worse. happening in the real world but all this stuff is happening in my head that's so much more interesting yes and it took it took you know a little while to immerse myself to the point where i got there but absolutely i think that's one of the reasons that those scenes where Anne is in mods head were one of the easiest for me to write and one of the most enjoyable i got to them <laughs> late and <laughs> I think that part of that is because I had learned what it's like to have a character speaking, you know, um, yeah. speaking at you and and not only during the writing process, but it's been an eight year journey to get to this point of of publication, not all of which was writing a lot of it was was, um, you know, all the other steps along the way. Um, but uh, her voice has not left <laughs> my head, so it's it's very much with me and I'm thankful that I chose this woman to write about because there's just a wealth of of interest and wisdom um, from from her that I that I just keep I keep feeling like I'm learning the the next lesson that I need in my life each step of the way with this book. Yeah, yeah, which is good. Um, I, you touched a little on process. I love to talk a little bit about process because I think um, one thing, uh, if you, if you are not um, a, a historical fiction writer, um, you you theoretically know, know that it might take a long time to write a book. Um, and yeah, some people spend years on a book. There are the whatever uh, people who put out a book a year, which is amazing. But you know, most writers, it, it'll take maybe a year or two to write a book. Many writers think about an idea for years and years and years. Maybe write a little bit here, a little bit there. They stop and start. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about the how long the process was, what were the various stages to getting to an actual published book, which is here on the table? Yes, many, many stages. Um, and I was practicing, I, I am a practicing lawyer and was practicing um, during all of the writing of this book. So that presented its own challenges and and it was helpful in, in its own ways too. Um, but that that was a key piece of it. Honestly, a, a lot of this book was written in 20 minute increments every day. So uh, a key when I, you know, after years of having this dream, um, but not doing it, um, when I actually sat down to do it, the most helpful thing to me was to set a daily time minimum. And a lot of times I was working, you know, a 70 plus hour a week job. And so that would be kind of the last thing that I would do in the day often. Um, not my ideal time to write. I found out I'm such a morning writer. I'm the least self-critical in the morning, uh, but I would do it when I could, which was at the end. Um, and I really think it's, it's a testament to the power of habit and making it an everyday practice. And I will not say that I have you know, mastered that habit because I've very much gone out of it um, for years since and at certain times and then gotten back into it. But a lot of it was written in short increments. And then so much of the process was editing. And then it was years to finding an agent, which I really felt like was a key um, for this book in particular, and then and to have it traditionally published, and then to uh, finding a publisher was its own journey. And then even after getting a publisher, I think it's been about two years from that initial um, signing with the publisher to the book coming out. So multi-stage process. And I think, you know, a, another thing about process that I'll say, I initially thought of writing as a pretty solitary act. And I thought that um, I would be going it alone. And, um, you know, I think that that's in, a, in many ways, the way that, that Maude approached writing, the way that that many of us do and one of the biggest things that i've come to realize is how how big of a role other people can play in the process and um particularly those really like key deep heartfelt supporters um and um to learn to be less alone and to learn to open up um, my writing to others has been a huge part of the journey and um two people in particular are just are here um <laughs> my husband david and my dear agent abby saul um, who have played such a role in uh, both being these great editorial masterminds and character masterminds 
but uh, beyond that being such emotional support and believing in me in this book through uh, so many stages of the process. And I just um, just have to express my tremendous gratitude and that, you know, it's, it's such a lesson that I've taken from Maud and from this whole process, how important it is to, um, to lean on and, and let in other people. And yes, clearly no one would go through this multi-year process filled with rejection and so heartbreak rejection. unless they literally couldn't stop themselves. <laughs> yeah. So if you learn nothing else about writers, there you go. You really um, learn your internal why. <laughs> you really do. Which is not about other people because there's no guaranteeing what anyone else no, will think. You're, yeah, yeah. Yeah, fame and fortune not guaranteed. Uh, <laughs> so clearly, you have to have a strong internal motivation. And yes, the right cheerleaders, really, yeah. really important. Um, just to have that voice, voices um, uh, along the way telling you, you can do it, keep going, keep going. Um, one element also you, you mentioned in your acknowledgments at the end in a, in a really beautiful way, I should have written the actual quote down, but you said your daughter came into the world kind of the same way, way as your book was coming into, you were pregnant and writing and editing at the same time, you know, a baby and now two-year-old. Yes, yes, almost two. Um, and one of the central themes of this book really is an off a writer trying to decide, do I really f like chase this dream of being a writer seriously or do I want a family? Mm -hmm. And <sighs> nowadays we can be told, and it is true, you can you can have both. Ab absolutely. Um, but the choice was a little more difficult in, in her time. Um, and so I'm assuming you started this book before you had a child. Um, how did becoming a mother going through that process? Did it change anything in the book, add something to it for you? Yes, uh, hugely. And I am somebody that's a way in which I could so relate to Maud. And I think part of the reason that I made this struggle such a such a big part of the book between kind of single minded pursuit of a creative goal and mixing in family motherhood um, marriage is that i had that that struggle and i really for a long time um said that i didn't want to have children and and a big part of that was because of my creative dreams and i didn't know if i could make them work together and then for a while when i was on the fence about it i i had this determination of okay but i'm gonna get a book published before i have a baby or i'll never do it <laughs> i know you know i i could see just losing track of that dream and if it doesn't happen before. And so I had this sort of rigid thinking around it. And I think it's just this amazing and beautiful irony in my life that it was uh, several weeks after having my uh, daughter that uh, I got the call from Abby that um, that the book had been that we had a book deal um, and I just remember it was you know I got a text from her she's in the East Coast it was very early morning and I had not I'd barely slept and I got up um, <laughs> to nurse and I just uh, was floored and flooded and it was most one of the most wonderful feelings but I think um, finding that that balance it's never a perfect balance but finding that balance for myself and kind of letting in the possibility of motherhood and the possibility of practicing and writing and all three mixed together into my life has been uh, one of the most profound things. And I'll say that I'm so grateful I got the opportunity to edit the book again because of how long this whole process takes. Um, a few times after that, um, uh, that, that book deal. And so I got to edit it as a mom and I rewrote some of the key scenes with Maude and her children young um, several times. Uh, and it just I had never quite gotten them right and I couldn't I don't think capture it the way I did without having experienced that myself. Yeah. Um, you, you touched on this a little bit and I um, want to give you a chance to answer maybe a little more fully um, to me the best historical fiction um, is set in the past, but offers some relevance to a modern reader right. Um, you don't have to write characters who sound as if they live today. That's one of my pet peeves. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, people who are kind of like too modern for their time, you know, strikes us as, you know, not authentic. Um, but at the same time, a story that is just solely set in the past about people doing old timey things that we can't relate to at all um, does not really engage me as a reader either. Um, so for for me, the historical fiction that I write, um, I think of it as um, time travel escapism. Um, 
I want to just be immersed somewhere else. And it's funny because I've purposely never written any storyline, which is really about moms and kids in any depth because I was living that life for real. Um, so for me, writing was, I wanna, I, one of my books was like set in the aftermath of the Titanic sinking, just because I was like, when I'm in that world, I am completely immersed in it, you know, uh, I'm not worried about the dishes. I'm not thinking, what time do I have to carpool tomorrow? Um, Red Mistress, Russian Revolution, talk about escapism. Um, but always, as I was, you know, in these historical worlds, the question was always, what would I have done if I had been there? And so the idea of a, a privileged, very spoiled young woman in Tsarist Russia, who literally loses everything, which is what happened to all the rich families, um, had absolutely nothing and literally not just nothing, but they couldn't even go to the communist run like cafeterias because they were um, considered what they call former people, meaning they, they did not exist anymore in the new communist state. So they couldn't literally even couldn't eat, could, literally could not eat. Um, and to me, that that idea of how do you how do you handle that? What would you do if you lost everything? I wanted to know how how people survived and they did and they did and I found that kind of inspiring um, even though I was not literally anywhere close to <laughs> her situation but it would it kind of made me realize people you know people have been through horrible things and they survive they find a way to get by they do the best they can they become different versions of themselves mm -hmm. the given what they've given what they've been through idea, reinvention idea um, so for you with after Anne, what about her life? What about this particular story? Do you think has the most resonance for like a modern reader today? Well, I just have to say to start that you imagine into those possibilities in such a beautiful and compelling way and read Thank mistress you. and I really couldn't put it down at the end and just I was so there in Nadia's choices and decisions yeah. and the reinventions. I think, you know, there's there's a lot I think the fact that Maud still keeps speaking, chirping away in my mind so much to, to is um, a testament at least to, to how she's informed my life and I feel like can speak to readers today. Um, but a few a few key things, you know, a few that jump out, um, they're Maud and, and her husband, Ewan, um, I hope this isn't giving too much away, but there's um, bromides and, um, uh, barbiturates were drugs um, that were very widely prescribed back in the day without a lot of understanding of kind of their addictive properties and the the really devastating effects that they could have in large doses and Maud and her her husband were both prescribed those drugs and that's kind of a key piece of the latter parts of the story um, and I think there's just such a a, a hard-hitting resonance with the modern day opioid crisis there um, there's this kind of theme of male insecurity and and the the threat of a woman out earning her husband i i saw this census bureau statistic that still today um both men and women in heterosexual marriages will um overstate his income and understate her income when the woman out earns the man which i think just shows the persistence of that um today and it was such a key piece of this story and it was really a key for me to unlock Ewan's character I can say in the first drafts he was deeply unsympathetic readers might still find him pretty unsympathetic and but to really round him out and understand him I had to understand how much of a threat it would have been to a man back then how few women would have um, earned money let alone out earn their husbands let alone out shown them in kind of every respect and been these cellar and you know Maud became the celebrated public figure throughout the world really but in Canada in particular she was kind of like the Mark Twain of her time and continues to be revered in that way so you know it's the just kind of the deep threat to a husband given the time and place in particular um, I think that that has so much to say to readers today and and a lot to be grateful for in our time and a lot to, of work still to be done um, and then just the um, you know that that competing um i guess the the tension between single-mindedly pursuing a creative life and how to mix in um, other elements of life i think that's something that 
so many of us can relate to today, um, maybe particularly women. Uh, but I think that that's some that's that's a a part of Maud's story that I I hope sticks with readers today. And you just your mention of the husband, the idea that you can't judge characters in the past a hundred percent by modern, modern standards, right. and even if they did some bad things or. It, if you want it to be a compelling read, you have to make that character understandable for who they were at the time, which you did. You know, Glad if it was just simply, yeah. you know, bad, mean husband, mm, right. then it's just, it's not as interesting, honestly, or, or emotionally effective, I think. Um, I think that's right. And that yeah. means doing the work inside to so understand them yourself, find, right? That's how it starts. Yes, yeah. I had to, I had to make a extremely hardcore, um, sociopathic uh communist um yeah you had a husband i i had to look at the too. world through his eyes and understand why he did some things that he did um so it's a good uh yeah did that it's a good learning process iterations for yes, you too. Yes, yeah yes yeah. so that's why we rewrite and rewrite so i'm gonna go um nerdy for a second um the, oh, with um and talk a little bit about re research and what goes into creating the world of the book um, historical fiction writers make things very hard on themselves because we not only have to write a full book, but then there's the second layer of making sure that all the details are right, down to really basic things like what did they eat for breakfast? Did they have a car? What How kind did the of toilets car? work? Did they have did toilets? This, did they have a yeah, phone? The, yeah. the most basic <laughs> things. Um, so it's like twice the work that we bring on to ourselves. And let me tell you, if you do get something wrong, guaranteed someone online will post a very long review telling you exactly what you got wrong, and it will be there forever on the internet. So um, we triple check everything. Um, so just tell me a little bit about um, the actual research creating her world. I know that you visited Prince Edward Island. I'm, I'm sure that was an important part of the process. It was. It was a it was a very important part of the process. I did it early on in the research and it really, first of all, it was just a childhood dream. And it gave me this sense of her world and place more than anything, where I felt like my descriptions of the nature, the beauty, the scene, you know, understanding that Avonlea and Anne of Green Gables was based on Cavendish and where it resembled. That was really, really helpful. Um, but for me, I think that the law background really helped in the writing historical fiction in terms of doing deep research but not just but learning how to decide when to start writing you know when to stop researching when to start writing and to the kind of power of an outline to really ground the research because there's endless amounts of reading to be done about and by ellen montgomery and i think that I ha having a working outline, which my law training drilled into me early on, allowed me to kind of know the bits and pieces that I was most interested in. And so then in everything I was reading, I could plug in, plug it into the, the parts that I wanted to tell. And I started with her journals being that kind of getting into Maud's mind, the best source for that. And then I, I saw it as kind of working my way out. So that was the closest to her went back to her fiction to kind of reimmerse in the voice. I feel like that was the best in terms of coming up with dialogue that would sound right at the time. Um, and of course, creating Anne's voice. Uh, and then this biography, um, Lucy Ma Montgomery, The Gift of Wings by Mary Henley Rubio, huge resource, so well researched. Um, that was tremendous. And, you know, because I had that working outline, then when I went to kind of secondary sources, criticism, you know, that body of work, I was able to really pick and choose and, and plug in the details that really mattered. Yeah. But I'd love to know about your process too. Um, your yes, process. yeah, I just, I, I just geek out basically. I start by checking out like a stack of books from whatever the time period is from the library, um, ordering, used copies on the line of books that are out of print, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's for me again it's like the world building comes first. And then within that world, I think what would be a good storyline set in that world, um, rather than starting from here's the story of what's going to happen it's it's like I have to live in that world for a while and again usually it's, it's <laughs> sometimes terrible. Um, but you know what what is a path that a person could take through this world that you know I want to follow along. Um, I love yeah, that and yeah. that there can be such different approaches yes, to yes, it. Yes, very much so. I think so. is so telling. There's yes. no one way and to do And then I that. also do a lot of, maybe you do this too, so then you know, I'll be writing the story. And again, I'm thinking specifically Red Mistress. Um, the first part is set um, 
19, 19, 18, 19, um, how would she travel from one place to another? They had car they had cars. What kind of car? What kind of cars did they have in Russia? Rich people in Russia, but some people still only went in carriages. I am not. I spent like days on this question, and in the in my draft, I would do things like then they went to the palace in, and I would just have it literally in caps. Figure this out later. Um, you know, then they had dinner find out what they ate. <laughs> and I would just have these big sort of holes in my manuscript that then I would do research round two, yes. trying to find all these little details, which again, 99% of readers do not care. I could have completely made up, but I just had that voice in my head, like, I'll be called out if I don't, you know, yes. get the right model car. <laughs> Same. I similarly had a lot of gaps in the manuscript that I would go back and then, and then research. And then there's the fact checking at the end. I, I was like a little obsessive in the copy editing beyond what a lot of writers do, but I really wanted to, particularly because I had quotes pulled from so many different sources, really go back and yes. verify each yes. of those. And that's that's its own huge process. Yes. And then you go through the editing rounds and thank goodness, various editors, copy editors will send back your draft going, page one, you said her hair was, you know, auburn and page 73, suddenly it's blonde. And you're like, I had no idea because I rewrote it five Thank times. Um, so it takes a team. <laughs> other people, yes, will also point out a few things um, that you that you get wrong, which is all that's that's what we want. Yeah. Um, so you, uh, another big question I wanted to get into that you that you touched on is how your background as a lawyer played into historical fiction writing. Specifically, you you, you mentioned it a bit. I think as someone without a law background, again, we have this. I I did not. Um, make the logical connection between working as an attorney and historical fiction, but talking about the amount of writing you have to do, the attention to detail, um, the idea that you're used to synthesizing a whole bunch of information and you have to kind of explain it um, in a, a more understandable way. Can, can you talk about a little bit more about that? The, yes. the, the yeah. skill set. <laughs> I went into law um, really with this writing bent, and so I chose litigation not because I, I love the fight and I love to win. I really am different than a lot of litigators, and <laughs> that doesn't really drive me. I chose litigation because it's where you get to do the most storytelling and writing in the law, and I think that, you know, at first it felt like they were just in competition. You know, I was I was um you know trying to balance my time to kind of steal away time from law work to write and and steal away time from writing to do all you know complete everything i needed to in my law job and i've come to find that um you know and i've had different kind of stages in in my law career too getting to jobs that um are kind of deeper and deeper fits and are, you know, allow me kind of the autonomy and really specializing in, in what I love most, which is the writing part of law, but that there's ways that they're so complementary and ways that were kind of in the background all the time that I wasn't aware of as I was writing. So the, you know, the research really distilling a lot um, and setting those kind of daily time goals and completing tasks. Um, there's often just you know, you, you really have to be disciplined and have to be able to make a schedule to um, do, uh, you know, kind of a big law job. And so that was tremendously helpful along the way. And I think I've come to realize that they're uh, more complementary um, than, than competitive um, in, you know, my process now. And I'm really, really grateful for my, all of my time in the law and my practice in the law. Um, and all of the, the people that have come into my life because of it. Yeah, and, and you mentioned a schedule and organization. I think again, again, there's the stereotype of like the creative writer, you know, we're a little messy and the, you know, the cigarette is over here and the papers are everywhere. And, Not me. The, and <laughs> I, they exist and they, yeah. maybe they're writing experimental poetry. Um, <laughs> But if you write historical fiction, um, yes, you need to be creative and, and all that, but you have to be really organized. Yes. Um, you have to keep all those details and facts straight. Um, you have to know where to find that random quote that you remember reading two years ago that is suddenly relevant and where is it in these folders of stuff. So I absolutely can see that, that again, it, it's, it's a similar kind of, I don't know, mindset or approach where um, even as you're living in an imaginary world, 
in the real world, um, you have to be organized. Yes. Um, right. So do, did you have like a dedicated writing space with like neat folders or like how to went for, like a writing space that was separate from a work space or not? Or were they kind of mixed? The corner of my couch was <laughs> my dedicated <laughs> writing space. Yeah. Um, I am somebody that I, so is anyone who's kind of been to my house or apartment can I tell I I don't like to have a lot of paper a lot of notes you know the way that a lot of people organize is just not my process I love I will put everything in a word document and then it's all contained on my computer and that makes you know that's just my um control freak self and and neat freak self um so it was really me and my computer and a big stack of books, um, as well as a lot of the research was online too, but, and done from, you know, kind of the comfort of my home. I've come to really honor, like, you know, a lot of go writers go out and write in coffee shops. I'm somebody, I think just because I'm, I'm really sensitive to noise, I'm sensitive to that. So being at home in my most comfortable environment is my best writing place. Yeah, yeah. I, what I need, about you? I need quiet too. I'm amazed by the people who write in the loud coffee shops because my problem is I love to eavesdrop too much, yep. um, which is a writer <laughs> thing also. Cause you're like, what's your story? Who are you? You know, and you get lost in um, another and world I can't and don't help get the words myself on the page. If yeah. anyone in that coffee shop is talking like, I want to hear about your trip to Europe. Really? Like, how did you afford to go for a month to Europe? Europe, you look really young like tell me more <laughs> true uh, true story I, I got no work done um yes so for me um quiet no distractions um I mean I, I do write at home a lot but the very best place for me is a library because even at home I'm also very guilty of like I need a snack hmm that needs dusting like, things I did not care about cleaning ever suddenly become very important um when I'm trying to write um you know what's in the fridge what's for dinner hmm if I'm in a library quiet um nothing else to focus on so that's the, pr probably my most productive place and I I live in the Chicago suburbs I have tested out um, probably about a dozen libraries around me. I'm very lucky to have lots of options. Um, so I know which ones to go to um, depending on my mood or, or the needs of that day. Um, but yeah, the, the people who can kind of write amid chaos or who I know some people who always write with music, um, which again, that's, that's great if that's part of their process. But um, then I would just sit there going, I should make a new playlist. I should come up with brand new songs just for this book. What song should they be? I'm going to spend a long time, you know, researching this. It's very important. So much of yeah. it is just that the mind games, the mind games that we can play with ourselves. Yes. And I think yes. anyone who's trying to create something, there's just so many blocks that your mind will will come up with, like anything yes. to avoid getting words on the page, because yes. it's just it's so vulnerable, and they never come out exactly like they are in your head. And just for me, it's been like what can drown out that critical voice in my head um you know whatever i can yeah. do to to well, do that is hopefully your eliminating distraction yeah, hopefully your characters start talking so loud that you can't <laughs> mm -hmm. hear the critical voice yeah. um i think we're, we're about to wrap up is there anything important that you feel we haven't addressed that you just want people to know about the book or about writing in general sure so i you know um a lot of people have asked why i write and and what i hope people take from this book and my writing in particular. And I, you know, I write about the creative life. I, I feel like that I have <laughs> defined as the thing that I wanna focus on. And I do that because I think that, um, I do that in the hope that it inspires other people to create themselves. I think there's so much creative drive in each of us. And I think here, you know, reading the stories of others and what they have overcome to create what they have, can be the best inspiration to kind of get over all the humps that we've been talking about today to actually do it. And from Maud's story in particular, um, you know, there's there's a lot of heart in this book, um, and there's a lot of huge success and brilliance and inspiration, and there's a lot of hard. And I think, you know, the why for me in telling those hard parts, um, I have found that through the hardest things that I've gone through in life, those have been the things from which I've learned the most. Um, those, you know, for better or for worse, are some of the things that that stick with me and that have moved me um, to make really big and important changes in my life. And I think for those who love and have been moved by 
um, Ellen Montgomery's creations to really fully understand their creator, but also I think to fully understand the creations, you need to, it's, it's so helpful to know um, not only the good, um, but the, the hard in life. Um, and I think, um, you know, that's, that's just something that I, I hope people take and that I have taken that will always stay with me from telling this story. Good, thank you. Are we wrapping up? Or... <laughs> I'm waiting for a signal. Speaking of online questions, we do have Shelley has a question online. How do you decide which portion or portions of the book should be fictionalized? And how does the reader know which parts are fictionalized? That's a great question. I think the the author's note can be so key for historical fiction because it allows us to give that window into our process and what parts we chose to tell and not to tell. Um, and you know what what parts are fictionalized for for Maud's story in particular, it was so important to me to really be true to her to this woman who had such a desire to be known. And I feel like, um, you know, in modern day times, a lot more of her story is understandable and meaningful than she felt like she could share in her own time. And so, you know, I really worked to keep as true to the story and, and as true to the facts of what we knew um, as I as I could, um, including rejecting some advice along the way to add in some salacious things or add in some, you know, I really wanted to stay true to that and because there were these gaps in her journals, there was space for fiction to enter. And so, you know, I go into that in my author's note about those places where I really felt like fiction could add um, while really trying to stay true to the characters, the dialogue, the speech, and what I knew about her and the decisions she'd made. Yeah. I get very angry when I've read a great historical fiction and they don't have a note at the end <laughs> telling me. Because yeah. that's your chance to, you know, tell tell the reader, you know, this I use my imagination, this I made up completely because there's no evidence one way or the other. Right. Um, I, I didn't used yeah. to read them, and now I read them with such oh. facets, like my favorite Absol part. Of, Absolutely. Of I look before I read novel. the book, like, no yeah. explanation at the end, forget it. No. Yeah. I'm being a little extreme. <laughs> but. Well, I guess people online are a little more... Uh, brave, uh, as everyone <laughs> is online. So there's a question from Patty. Before we read this book, do we do we need to read Anne of Green Gables? That's a great question. Some of my uh, favorite, um, favorite kind of reflections on the book are from readers who never read Anne. Um, and so I think uh, you know, I think you can go either way in terms of I, I definitely don't think I in no way intended this to be a book just for Anne lovers as much as I am a kindred spirit and and um, embrace kind of that audience I really think it's a life that has has so much to say to so many of us um, and lovers and not but one of my deepest hopes is that the book does draw readers to or back to uh, mods fiction which is just such a tremendous uh, body of work so maybe you could start here and then and then go to Anne of Green Gables hello <laughs> Um, I came to start reading historical fiction kind of later in life. It was a genre that I largely ignored um, growing up on like fantasy and having a lot of other interests. And I really enjoyed it when I first read it. Did you always know that that was the style of writing you wanted to do? And what book first introduced you to the genre? Oh, that's such a good question. Hi, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> that mic is not nearly high enough for you. Um, <laughs> thanks so much for coming. Um, I, I didn't set out to write historical fiction. I really was interested in, like I said, these the lives of, of real people who had struggled with some of the same things that I was struggling with. And so it, that was my come from. And I think Elizabeth can speak to a different perspective. Um, and you know, in, in telling that story, I really I was so interested in a real life, and so I grounded it in a person in history, and then it became historical fiction. Um, it's so hard to think of the first. I can say that uh, Loving Frank by Nancy Horan was a historical fiction that had such a deep impact on me and was a big influence for this book and, and highly recommend 
about a creative creative life, but I think so often the stories about creative lives are focused on the, you know, the wife of the creator. I love, um, you know, I, I love the fact that this one focuses on a, on a female creator. Yeah. Well, I'm all into escapism, as I've said, I <laughs> read to escape. So, um, I, I read a lot of mysteries and suspense, um, too, to, to sort of satisfy a different kind of reading need, you know, I just need a fast story and get lost in this plot, et cetera. Um, in terms of historical fiction, I, I'm going to be honest, it's a little problematic, but I'm gone with the wind, which um, those of you my age and older will understand was just a phenomenon, a book and movie, which now many people rightly so have issue with, but it was a big fat book with a ton of drama, a very sassy heroine who did things that you know shy little me couldn't imagine doing but you like you wanted to read about seeing someone being very bold um so i think again with historical fiction even within historical fiction there's different kinds there's very literary historical fiction um then and there's full-on escapist battles um uh, kind of game of thronesy which is such a range which is fantasy but written as if it were historical fiction i that's another series that i i ate that up <laughs> so even within historical, you can get a range of different styles and moods. Um, how long did it take you to write this book? It has been eight years from start of research to now. I think the writing was probably a solid year and a half of that. They say that writing is 50% editing. For me, it was 90% editing. So there was a huge phase of it that was editing. And then a number of years, you know, of the finding an agent, finding a publisher part. So, um, you know, uh, it it definitely was a long journey just in the writing of it. Um, but there's there's all these other pieces too. So it really is, um, you know, you figure out. Elizabeth and I were talking about this. Right? You figure out your why really quickly because um, it has to be about kind of the internal drive to to write and to create things um, because there's so much that's unpredictable about how it's how it's received and everything else. Um, and I really think that the fact that it took this long for me um, kind of reinforced that why over and over again, which was really helpful. Hello. Um, so my question is uh, based on my experience reading after Anne Ewan's character or per figure, and then also what you just mentioned about your sociopathic person in your book. <laughs> yes. Um, like writing through the lenses of those people, how does does that change you in your life when you encounter folks? Like just like what does that do to you as a person? Such a good question. That's such a good question. A good question. Uh, thank you, Jillian. I oh my goodness. I I think I hope it's made me more deeply empathetic. Um, you know, and really understanding where kind of deep seated insecurity can come from and how it can play out in in unexpected and hard ways over the course of a life. And um, I think I will always take that with me um, and see my myself in you and see all the you know the people that I love in in that character really diving deep in I think and and hope I mean it sounds cheesy but has, has made me a better person. I, I just I think you can't you you have to be empathetic to be a writer in the first place. You have to be curious about other people, right? Put yourself in other, you know, the minds of your characters. Um, and so I, I just think writers in general are sort of curious about other people and how they live and how their brains work. And that doesn't mean that in real life, if, it, if I'm dealing with someone nasty, it does not mean that I'm like, tell me more about your about your troubled childhood. And I want to feel free. Like in real life, it's like you're being annoying, whatever. But within developing a character you you have to for me it's i'm not excusing this person i just need to explain why they're acting the way they are because in their mind they're doing the right thing right. so and understanding people that are so different from us i mean that's like such a, a key to living right and i think by exploring both of us went to kind of an extreme yeah. in that but um you know it, really diving deep into someone who is different it yep. just it didn't yep informs a lot they have their reasons yeah yeah <laughs> so what uh what was amazing for me is of course at the time that Maud was alive people often had diaries men and women and all 
and um, depending on how they wrote them, they were very personal. I mean, I started a diary when I was eight. Um, I have two bankers boxes filled of my volumes. My children do not want them. And the thing that got to me was I started tearing pages out because mm -hmm. there were things I didn't want them to see. How did you fill in the blanks? I mean, other than the fictional part of it, obviously there were other people who had something to say. How did, where did you find those things? I mean, were they in other people's diaries? <laughs> how, how did you find them? It's such a good question. And I, as a journal keeper, since I was maybe six too, I relate so much. And that was such a way that I related to Maude and was so fascinated by Maude. Um, but I found, so the, the biography that I mentioned earlier was just a tremendous resource. It had pulled accounts, um, the author had pulled accounts from so many who were in Maude's life, her, her former maids, kind of a wealth of information to really explore what was probably taken out, um, where, you know, a lot of kind of best guesses about what was missing. And so that was kind of place number one. Um, and then, you know, place number two was kind of all that I gathered from, you know, the, the secondary source material out there um, that could inform kind of what was happening in the historical context at the time. Um, but the biography was really a key. To thank everyone on Zoom, we have a final question from Debbie online, and this is for both authors. How much leeway do you take with timelines? So um, in my early drafts, like none. <laughs> I was very, my, my lawyer analyzer herself wanted it all exactly right. And I will say that all of the dates, I double checked them in that copy editing process. They're all, they're all correct. Um, but I think the real kind of leeway and, and breath and freedom that I gave myself later in the process was in writing the birthday weekend scenes when Maude is kind of young and Anne of Green Gables is about to be published and she's in this struggle of do I just create or do I marry? Do I have these children that I've been wanting? Um, and giving myself that permission, it was, I, I have to credit my wonderful editor, Tessa Woodward and, and Abby again for really kind of expanding my vision that I could do that and I could create a piece of Maude's story um, that wasn't in the historical records and really guess as to that, that birthday was missing from her journals and, and not only you know, have that be part of the book, but have it be this sort of expansive part of the book. Um, that was kind of the biggest uh, timeline leeway that I took and it ended up being just one of the most rewarding parts of the writing process. I think the further back in history, the more you can fudge a little because there's not as much records. Makes sense. Um, yeah. The closer you are to present day when everything is is very well documented, um, you, you don't have a lot of leeway. Certainly um, the events of the Russian Revolution, if I was like, this is dragging on too long. I want this to happen in six months. Um, problem. Um, so where the where the leeway comes is just what you choose to include. Uh, and that's picking and choosing which parts of the history. So, so you have the right dates, you, you have the timeline, but you, you know, you're not going to include everything. So you're choosing your version of that history to, em to emphasize, such as yes. a pivotal weekend rather than everything. Yeah. Folks, I just want to thank you both for this wonderful conversation. And I want to thank all of you for coming. Let's get one more round of applause for our speakers today. <laughs> <laughs>